Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar on how to create a culture of growth at your church or your organization. I'm so excited to have Pastor Michael Kelly, who is the senior pastor of the Mount Rubido Church with us today to just kind of take us behind the scenes to show us some of the things that he's been able to do successfully at his church. Now, I had the honor of serving as his executive pastor for about four years, and we had a great time together. Definitely had some highs and we had some lows, but through it all, we were able to really try to move that church forward. And I just wanted to bring him on and just give you an opportunity to hear from him, a high impact, high performance leader, what he's doing at his church to really move the church forward. Now, I wanna say that we recorded this webinar earlier today, and many of you all were on live and you caught it. However, in the recording process, we did hit a few bumps in the road. So like the first three, four minutes of it, unfortunately, we weren't able to restore that. And so the first three or four minutes are gone. Um, however, uh, when we jump in, you still have tons of content. The first three, four minutes was just me rambling anyway. So you didn't miss anything. Pastor Kelly's gonna jump in. And he's gonna really just kind of pull the curtain back and show you what he's doing at his church. Now, I also wanna just let you know that we are offering free consultation that if you're a leader at a church or an organization and you're trying to move your church forward, you're trying to figure out how you can align your team and implement a culture of leadership development, I would love to connect with you. Jump over to my website, visionclarity360.com. That's visionclarity360.com. And there you can sign up for a free 30 minute consultation. I think it would add so much value just to get someone else's perspective. This is something I love to do. It's a passion of mine, it's a gift of mine, and I really like to come alongside of organizations and help them develop a culture to win. All right, so without further ado, here's Pastor Kelly, and I hope that you enjoy it and that you're blessed. Let's go. What I wanna do is I just wanna go through, man, uh, really just our process and what we did to get there. You were actually a, a part of this at Rubido, so I know a lot of this is gonna seem uh, very familiar. Don't let Pastor Your Lord fool you. Um, a lot of what we're able to experience was because of his uh, time there at Mount Rubido. And so, man, it was just an honor to serve with you and great to you know, to do this with you here. So um, I'll go ahead and, and, and jump in, man. I wanna share my screen. Uh, let me know if you guys can see that, um, okay. Um, uh, but when, when we were here at uh, Mount Rubido, when I first arrived there, we were in this uh, brand new location and the location immediately let me know that we weren't going to be able to do church typically the way that in our particular denomination, Seventh-day Adventist, which is a Christian denomination, we believe that Christ is the center and the head of everything that we do. Um, it really became clear that we're not going to be able to reach this community and grow if we continue to do things the way that we were always, quote unquote, taught to do them. Because to be honest with you, in the denomination, for those of you who are very familiar with that, um, Adventism kind of sets us up like a franchise. And what that means is, here we are, um, you know, if you look at McDonald's, McDonald's, every McDonald's you have is gonna have the golden arches. Every McDonald's you have is gonna have a Big Mac. Everything is really gonna be uh, the same. No matter what neighborhood it's in, the menu is pretty much the same. Everything at McDonald's is the same. And kind of with churches, it was kind of the same way. Like you've got the same ministries, you got the same structure for your board, the same thing. But we quickly realized, and this is the first thing that we really had to hit, is that church is not a franchise. Like, it is absolutely not a franchise. We could not do things the way that we had been kind of outlined to do them and be able to effectively grow and reach our community. So when we started to understand that, we said, okay, if church is not a franchise, then what that meant is we had to try to figure out exactly who it was that we were and how we were going to be able to be successful and being able to grow. And one of the things that I, I like to do, and I'm gonna be dropping some books that I recommend you guys have to look at, uh, Patrick Lencioni is an amazing author. And one of the books I was reading from him was The Advantage. And in The Advantage, he talks about what is it that makes any kind of organization, whether it's profit or not for profit, be able to grow. And his big thing was, a healthy culture like that was his big thing and so we knew that we couldn't simply do a bunch of uh, programs you know that were going to make our church grow but we actually had to have a healthy culture and the way he defines a healthy culture isn't simply people getting along but a healthy culture and here's i really want you guys to get this a healthy culture is when that organization is clear on why it does what it does 
what its purpose is, why it exists. That's what makes the culture healthy. And it's something that not only the leader of that uh, organization will know, but it's actually something that everyone within the organization knows from the top down. So in, in a church dynamic, it's not gonna be just leaders, but it's gonna be the members. They know very clearly why we exist, where we're going, how we're gonna get there. So what Lencioni says is in order to establish this healthy culture, he actually says you have to ask six questions about your organization. So what we did at Mount Rubido, honestly, is we answered those six questions. And what I wanna do is just take you guys through um, the process that we went through that did not take three months, that did not take four months, that did not take seven months, but literally took almost 18 months for us to really solidify this. And I, I really need people to hear that because sometimes as pastors, we want to rush, get our thing going. But when you rush through it, you're not going to get everyone to totally buy into what that clarity is. And we'll talk about, you know, some of those some things later. So uh, Lindsay only has six questions. And I, I really would love for you guys to write these six questions down and be able to see what it is that we did and how it is that we answered them. Now, at Mount Rubido, to answer these six questions, we had our leadership team do that. I have a multi-level staff at my church. Uh, we're, we're a larger congregation, so I have multiple pastors. But if you don't have a, a you know, staff like mine, what you want to do is you want to determine who are your leaders. And when I say leaders, not just by position, but also by gift set and influence. Um, so if you have a smaller church and you're the only pastor there, it might be some of your elders. It might be a few of your board members. And you might find some people within the congregation. And what I suggest you do is you form a leadership team. The kind of people you want on this leadership team do not need to be doers. They actually need to be visionaries and they need to be thinkers. You don't want to get people on this particular team that are completely focused on the how. You want people who are more focused on the why, uh, the big picture and the vision. These six questions really are going to start answering bigger pictures for your organization. Um, what you don't want to do necessarily at this point is completely get bogged down in all the details. There are some details, obviously, you're going to see that we'll go through, but you want visionaries on this team. So if you don't have a multiple pastoral staff like I did, that's what made up our leadership team. And what you want to do is get your elders, get some leaders from ministries, from the board, or also from the congregation. Uh, so the first question Lencioni says that you have to answer is why do we exist? Uh, another way that you might find that question to be answered is, you know, would people even care if we left? Uh, and if they did care if we left, why would they care? That's kind of your why uh, for existing. So what we did is we came up with our vision statement. And the vision statement is simply reaching people far from God. And it's funny, Seth, I think you'll remember how we came up with that. Um, we were sitting in a board meeting and we were watching uh, the Elevation story uh, with Stephen Furtick's church. And they kind of had made this statement and we just looked at each other, kind of clicked in that moment. Like, mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, is this it? And we went back to the pastoral staff and we were just praying and really talking over this. And we really felt that, you know, that burden that, man, th this, is, this is really why we're here. Um, that there are people who are far away from God and we believe it is our responsibility to reach them. Mm -hmm. Now, we had to ask ourselves a question when it came to that vision, because remember, why do we exist? Like, who are the people that we would consider far from God? And so we used our, our biblical model here in Luke 15, the parable of the lost things. And so what we did is we broke down uh, the people who we considered far from God into three areas, uh, lost sheep, no religious affiliation, lost coins, religious, but not spiritual. So these are individuals who are in the church, religious, they know how to go through the motions, but really don't have uh, a deep, intimate relationship with Christ. Then also prodigal sons, these are people who are disenfranchised with church, but they're familiar with it. So they might have been hurt by church for whatever reason, but they're not part of that. I'm going to get to something a little later, but I want to say something about this target here as we put together our, our vision. We also began to recognize, and I'll, I'll get into this just a little later, that we actually aren't equipped to reach all three of those areas. So mm -hmm. even in our idea of reaching people far from God, we had to be very introspective on seeing why we exist, what we're actually capable of, and could we actually reach lost sheep? Could we actually reach lost coins? And what we discovered was, man, lost sheep, we, we're really not equipped to do that. Some of that was some denominational issues. Lost coins, we felt we were already doing that, but we were really finding 
and who we were reaching were people who were disenfranchised with church, but were spiritually open. And so that's where we started honing in our ministry, which I'll get into in a moment. So as you start to put your vision together, you also have to be very clear, what is my vision saying why we exist and who also are we trying to reach with our existence? So would you say, um, that, would you say that your target is prodigals, sons and daughters? Like, would you say that at this point? Or are you, do you feel like, yeah, we're also, but we're also still trying to reach the lost sheep? No, so, so we're, we're very clear, like, just like Paul was like, I'm to the Gentiles and Peter, right. you're to the Jews. Um, we are trusting our other sister churches um, and when we say sister churches, we don't only mean in our denomination, just mm -hmm. in our community to reach the lost sheep because they're just better equipped for that. Okay. Um, from my experience, um, our denomination sometimes can make it a little difficult to reach lost sheep. Mm -hmm. But those who are a little dis disenfranchised with church who are spiritually open, that's who we're, we believe we're more equipped to reach. Yeah, that was my question. If the, if the prodigal sons ever get in the way of trying to reach the lost sheep, right? Or if the lost right. coin ever gets in the way of trying to reach the lost sheep, like if there is a tension there, but it sounds like there is obviously. And as a result of that tension, you've just said, okay, we're just going to really focus our time and energy on trying to reach the prodigals. And, and, and that's tough to say. And it's not like we're saying leave everyone left behind, but we have a team mentality when it comes to ministry. So, you know, your church might be more equipped to reach the lost sheep. And like I said, there's some other churches in our area. And so we're hoping that that's something that they do. Right. Um, because and it's, not just like, know. it's not like if a lost sheep come, if someone who is not, no religious affiliation comes to your church, you're going to turn them away. So it's not exclusive, right? But you're just saying our programming, our, our, our messaging, our, our target is the prodigals. And if we just so happen to um, reach sheep or coins along the way, then, hey, praise God, that's a win for everyone. But this is who we're targeting. Yeah, and that's how we're structured. Now, you know, to your point, um, just... Three weeks ago, um, one of our members invited seven atheists to church. Um, literally, just unbelievers, like completely atheists. They came to church. Um, and, you know, I think they had a great experience because of the community we try to have. But we didn't create an experience for the atheists, you right. know, for the person who in church. If they came, though, you know, hopefully, you know, they weren't from California, but they come back. But that's our focus is that. Our focus so is that. Last question before you go on. Um, someone just chimed in. Uh, so when you decide, when you say prodigals or coins or sheep, that doesn't, that doesn't, um, that's not specific to a denomination or religion, right? And so you can have prodigals who are Seventh-day Adventists, and you can have prodigals who are Baptists, and you can have prodigals who are Methodists, who would all fall under that prodigal category. Right, because the way we define a prodigal is someone who is spiritually open, so they have some familiarity because the story of the prodigal, he knows about home. He was raised, you know, at home. He had some affiliation with home. Something though happened at home that made him no longer comfortable there. So he wants to go away. So our okay. thing is we want to be able to, we believe we're best equipped to reach people who understand a little bit about church, but have been hurt by it. Or maybe, you know, we're committed to church, but never were committed to Jesus. You know, those right. kinds of things. They have some spiritual background. Right. Even and home, I love, I, love how, I love how you're saying that. Home isn't necessarily Adventism or right. Methodism. It's just church, period. Like, church, period, church period. right. That's, That's it. Yeah. So uh, along with that vision, um, you know, and I, I'm always going to give, you know, where we get our help from, because some people think that we just come up with this all on our own. Um, but, I, we, you know, we sat down with Seth. Uh, so, so you guys know, he came in. And a part of you know, his bridge solutions and his vision clarity, um, uh, he helped us really flesh out this part of our vision uh, from uh, this incredible process you know, called Stratob that we were able to use and connected it with God dreams or God visions, I, I believe is, is what it is. And there were two areas that we really looked at what our vision was going to encompass. And what it was, was simply advancing, which means we looked at a geographical location within our zip code, uh, within the Inland Empire. We knew, um, as Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other most parts of the world. We said, before we hit all those other places, we've got to deal with what our Jerusalem is. Mm -hmm. And so we established what our Jerusalem was and said, this is the area. This is the one to two mile radius around Mount Rubido where we want to advance. And what that simply meant was, we want to saturate that area with people hearing, seeing and experiencing the gospel. So we weren't just going to preach the gospel. 
but we wanted them to see it through the way that we lived our everyday lives, interacting with the community. Mm -hmm. We wanted them to hear it so that if they came into our church community, they hear the preaching of the word and the uplifting of Christ and the gospel of Jesus. But we wanted them to experience the gospel by us making our community better. And we picked an area that we were going to advance the gospel. So that was a big part of our reaching people. We were saturating an area with them hearing, seeing, and experiencing the gospel. Then the next part that we said is when they are reached and when we do touch their lives, we want them to become something. So we don't want them to just say, oh, we've reached them. It's really cool. You're coming to our church. You're attending. You're sitting there. And we can just get some good numbers. We said, no, what do we want you to become? And, and what we landed on, which you'll see a little more in just a moment, is we want people to become fully devoted um, disciples of Jesus Christ. So when we advance the gospel, when people receive it, and they come into the community, which is Mount Rubido, we want them to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And here's one of the ways that is very big for us at our church. Um, a disciple for us is someone who has moved from being the recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. Mm, that's good. So yeah, we, we don't want you to come after you've advanced, we've reached people far from God, then you come into our community, we want you to become someone who's not just receiving, but you're actually, you know, responsible for what mm -hmm. just happened to you in your life. So mm -hmm. that's where we came up with that first question, like, why do we exist? And although we just went through that in about seven minutes, um, you gotta really flush that out, mm -hmm. you know, to really, answer that question and get everyone on board. Um, so the next thing, which I'll go through a little quickly, is this idea that Lencioni asked us, how do we behave? And really what how do we behave means is what do we value? So when you look at values, this is the behaviors that are acceptable or not acceptable within your organization. Your values are gonna drive a lot of the decisions you make. And if you don't value anything, that means you value everything or you can almost value nothing. And to be honest with you, um, the way you behave, whether you have written values or not, already speak to what it is that you do or don't value. Mm -hmm. um, so you just kind of look around your organization and see, okay, if you have a church that has a bunch of messy rooms and things like that, then you clearly um, don't value organization. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way it is. So Lencioni says there's two different kinds of values, and here's what we looked at. They're actual and then aspirational. So actual means these are things that you're already doing before you even called them values. You just look and say, you know what? Our church culture already has this going. Mm -hmm. Then you have aspirational, which says these are values we don't have. We're not behaving this way, but we look to behave that way. Mm -hmm. So you usually want to see about two or three um, actual values, maybe even four. And then you want to come up with about three or four aspirational values. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to share with you guys some of the values we have. I'm not going to break down all of their definitions, um, but this is how we said we want to behave in Mount Rubido. I would suggest you don't copy these. Um, mm -hmm. these, are just, these are just ours. This is our relationship that we have with each other and, and, and with God. So we believe found people found people, find people. So that's another way of us saying that if you are a, a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to help other people follow Jesus Christ. You can't just be sitting doing that on your own. Um, that's an aspirational value for us because our church wasn't doing that. Um, we believe God deserves our best. Um, so it's important for us. Some people have accused us of putting on a show um, mm -hmm. at Rubido and we're okay with that because we believe that God is excellent and we're gonna give him absolutely our best. This was an actual value because every time Rubido did something, we found that it was always very good. We were very timely as far as wanting things to be done a certain way because we just believe if Disneyland can be orderly and put everything together, then so can we for God. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. believe you can't do life alone. Another actual value, we just connected it to small groups, but Rubido was already a very unique church in the sense that they were very grouped up unintentionally. We just introduced mm -hmm. small groups to make it more intentional. Uh, we believe Gracefield homes make eternal homes. Um, the family is very important for us um, at Mount Rubido, so that's a value. Um, we believe everything that we have uh, belongs to God. So stewardship and aspirational value, not just of money, but time, talent, treasure. Uh, good leaders grow great leaders. Um, mentorship is a big thing for us. So we actually just voted, man, our, um, our new process for nominating committee where it's basically based on mentorship, where mm -hmm. the next person who's going to take in is someone who's been mentored for at least two years. So we don't have to like pick brand new names every year. 
it's someone who's been mentored uh, through, through the whole way. Um, so the next question, those are values. So you got to come up with your values and that's what you'll do as your leadership team. Next real, question. Real quick, real quick, I just want to jump in because with those values, I just want to be clear because you said um, values are how people behave, right? And I really want to drive that home. You're looking at your congregation, you're saying, how do we feel as a community our people need to behave? And so you came up with six things and you say, okay, we need, we believe that if you're part of this family, this connection, this, 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 this church, that you, the way that we behave is that we connect with one another. Mm -hmm. So you have that connection value. You said, we believe that we treat one another like family, not like family where, you know, Thanksgiving dinner and the uncles and the aunts are, are going at each other, but like family, like we love, we accept people, you know, no matter who, what you've done, how you messed up, family still accepts you, right? But you can always come back to family. You said stewardship. So you said, we believe that we, how do we want people to behave? We want them to be stewards of their, their resources, their time, their talents, right? Um, you said excellence. How do we want people to behave? We want them to give God their best in every area, right? And so you went down um, this list. And so I just want to make sure it translates to the person who's watching to say, these values are really about how do we want that individual to behave? Yes, how we behave corporately as a church, but also as individually, this is what we expect from a member if you're a part of this church. Yeah, so I, I mean, and, and it's almost to the point, I, you know, I love the way you said it, you know, so we can make that clear individually. We would want somebody to feel uncomfortable if they're not behaving accordingly. Right. Not in a like works oriented kind of righteous by works kind of way, but if you are somebody who has accepted Jesus Christ and you're at Mount Rubidoux, and you go a whole year and you have not brought someone to Christ Jesus, we want you to feel that. Like, we want you to feel like, wait a second, I almost feel like I don't belong because these values I'm literally just not living up to. And then what we have to do is ask the question, well, why? Is it because you haven't bought in? Is it because it's not clear? Have we not been creating enough opportunities for you to live out that value? Um, do we need to, you know, again, surround more clarity around it? Do we need to have more talks about it? So mm -hmm. it clearly is a behavioral thing because if people aren't behaving according to the value, it's just the good things that we have on paper. Yeah. And yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so the other question, you know, we asked next. The third question Lencioni asked is, what do we do? And we're in the business of making disciples. Like, that is what we do. Our goal is to make disciples. And we'll break that down just a little bit further in, in just a moment. Because uh, you're going to see how everything really tied in for us. So it's pretty much saying, what does a Chick-fil-A do? They make food. And they don't just make food. They make chicken. They don't make beef. They don't, you know, do any of that. They're giving you chicken in and out burger. Mm -hmm. um, what do they do? They make burgers. And that's what they're going to give you. That's what they do. They're unapologetic about that. That's literally what they do. And what I think is very easy for us to say is that every church is in the business of making disciples. Yes and no, because I think some other individual churches might have churches that are full of disciples and where they are and why they exist, they might understand, I don't exist to make any more. I might exist to just keep the ones that are kind of there already in the discipleship field. And I know that that's very hard for us to hear but sometimes I think we try to do what other churches are doing and you've got to figure out what specifically has God called us to do and who has he called us mm -hmm. uh, to make, um, you know, with that. Scary thought, I know, but that's what it is. Um, next question that Lentini asked you to answer, which I'll just break down a little further later, is how will we succeed? And what that is, is your church's strategy for success. I'm going to loop back into that. Um, and we're almost there because I want you to see how that fits into this other uh, part of our picture. But what we literally had to do is sit down and say, okay, if we're going to be successful at what we do, if we're going to be successful at why we exist, how will we be successful? What is the strategy, the overall strategy, not the individual ministry per se, but the overall strategy that our church is going to have for success? Uh, like I said, I'm going to loop back into that. Um, the next question that we answered is what is most important right now? Um, what that simply means is in the year 2019, we're gonna use this for example, because this will change out. Every year, and sometimes it carries over, you need to have what is called a BHAG, 
Um, if you're a Christian, you'll call it a big, holy, audacious goal, um, you know, or a big, hairy, audacious goal, as some people in the uh, secular sector would call it. This is a goal that is not an individual ministry, but it's something that takes every resource almost of the entire church that we can kind of really point to that will move your vision forward. So what that means is if every individual ministry in 2019 in Mount Rubido accomplished its goal, it would help us accomplish what's most important right now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that keeps you very focused. It keeps everyone rallied around one, part, one point. And what's important now will also tie in to what our overall vision is. What's important mm -hmm. right now doesn't take us right or left. It keeps us reaching people far from God. Mm -hmm. um, so for Mount Rubido, what it was was homecoming. And I don't know, Seth, if you really want me to get into what homecoming is or just, you know, you know the Let's concept. Of, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can summarize it for us. Yeah, so homecoming really, and you can see the screen, um, is really us reaching um, 1,000 prodigals because we said that's our target group. Um, so we want to reach 1,000 prodigals. And the idea is these main different initiatives around are all our rationale around this circle. If you see that circle in front of you, are what we do to help us reach those thousand individuals. We have okay. Connect 10K, which is our reach initiatives. We're going into our community, doing incredible acts, after school program to reach one, you know, a thousand individuals. Invest and invite, that ties into our values. Found people, find people. Miracle messages, we partner with another entity. We reconnect homeless people with individuals in their families so they can get off the street. Hero Maker is our mentorship program. Then in uh, 2019, 2020, we're starting a multi-site. So when we gain a thousand people, our goal is not to just sit them in Mount Rubido, but we actually want to take the thousand, then take about three to 400 and start another campus. So that's a big part of why that's important now and how all those things connect to it. More details, of course, we didn't have that to mention. I mean, this is, this is, this is wonderful. I mean, if, and for those who are watching and listening, I just want to, so I just want to, show you how he's able to connect the dots. So our, our target is very clearly prodigals. And so the way that we're reaching prodigals is through this campaign or initiative called Homecoming. Obviously, Homecoming, it's you are creating an environment. You are trying to bring the prodigal home. And so just the connection between the two, I mean, to me, some of my people might think, oh, it doesn't make a difference. But to me, it's, it's branding, it's messaging. You're, you're really trying to create a very clear picture for your congregation, for your leadership team, so they know that, hey, we're, we're, this, this initiative called Homecoming is to reach prodigals because we want the prodigals to come home, right? So, I mean, I love that. I love that. That's good. And, 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 that's, and that's what's important now. So that's what, you know, we just keep pushing, pushing, pushing for the rest of the church. Um, the next question we ask is, um, who must do what? Um, and here's a big thing. And I know for those of you who are in a smaller church, don't look at this only as uh, hired or paid staff, uh, but just what you need to accomplish this vision. And here's a, the big thing that's important, staff for where you want to be, not where you currently are. Um, so don't just get the people, oh, I only got 100 people at my church, so I only need this many people. No, you need to get the amount of people you need for 250 people. Um, because that's what you need to do staff, you know, for, um, for your growth. Um, so how, do you, after, how, how do you do that if you don't have budget, if you don't have budget? <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. I mean, staffing I, always comes down to budget. So how do you well, staff? What, so what, what, what staff, we always assume staff means paid. And um, what I love what one of my mentors, Mark Woodson, said, he said, I have what are called hired volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, you're not paid, but you're hiring volunteers. So as you staff your church, look at staffing also as my volunteer base. And you say, look, if we're trying to grow from 100 to 200, what do I need at 200? Mm -hmm. I need to get that at 100. Mm -hmm. So that by the time I get to 200, I'm, I'm already in that place. I'm not overwhelmed. Because what happens is, let's say God just overwhelmingly blesses you. And then you've got 200 folk that just all of a sudden just start pouring in. You're not staffed. You're not ready for that. You don't have a volunteer base or system for that. So you need to create where you know your vision is taking you and operate now. Now, that's so contrary to people because sometimes they're thinking, oh, no, no, we need to wait till we get there. Then we'll start thinking about who we need to get. No, no, you think about that now. And it's also, a, it's, it's also like 
stamp of your mark saying, God, we expect you to do that. We expect mm -hmm. you to do this. So we're actually prepared for the increase now. Mm -hmm. That's good. Going with that. That's good. So after we've answered these six questions, here are the next few things that we, that we had to do. And, and these are four things. I'm not going to take credit for these ourselves. This is an incredible book. It might seem old school, but it's really worked for us called Simple Church. And it really says that you're, you should really be a, a, a line, uh, a process of these four things, clarity, movement, alignment, focus. Um, here's how we define clarity. Clarity is the ability of the process to be communicated and understood by the people. Now you say, what do you mean the process? Well, we're in the business. What we do is we make disciples. So the question that we had to ask is, okay, what is the process for us going about making these disciples? So what we had to do is define it. People will be a part of something if they know where it's going. People will not embrace ambiguity. And ambiguity is not only a vision statement on the board. Ambiguity is, okay, you're, you, you say that you exist to reach people far from God. You say when you reach us, you want us to become disciples. And that's what you're in the business of doing. And you want me to be not just a recipient of Mount Rubido's vision and mission, but you actually want me to be a participate, participant in it. So tell me, like, who do you want me to become and how am I going to be that by coming to your church? Uh, so three things you have to do. Determine what type of disciple you want. That's what we did. Determine the process on how we're going to make that person. And then we're going to demonstrate how each part, part excuse me, uh, fits in this process. Mm -hmm. um, so here's what we said about disciple. We defined a disciple. We believe a disciple has three components of their life. Intimacy with God, we call it love. Fellowship with believers, we call it grow. And then influence in our community, we call it serve. So love simply means this, uh, being a part of a worship experience. So we want you to be a part of a worship experience as a disciple. Grow means we want you to be a part of a group. Because at Mount Rubido, we don't believe people grow in rows. We believe they grow in circles. Um, so that's very important for us there. Mm -hmm. Then we also want you to serve. You can't just be a part of a group off on your own, be a part of an awesome worship experience, but we want you to serve. And what that means is you're volunteering, either working cameras in the church, being a greeter, an usher, um, maybe as our elder or even one of our leaders. But also when we go out into our community, our after school program, we want you to be a part of that. Um, so that kind of ties back into this question, how we will succeed. Because mm -hmm. here's what our strategy is. We create a dynamic worship experience, love. We create intimate group experiences, grow. And we create service opportunities, uh, which is our serve. So our point is, how are we going to succeed if we want to make people disciples? We've got to create the experiences and environments for individuals to do what we're asking them to do and become a particular uh, disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we have to make very clear. So we make very clear, love, come to worship, grow, be a part of a group, and then serve, volunteer, and be a part of uh, some kind of outreach. Mm -hmm. So that also, if you hear that, also deals into the movement that we want people to have. So mm -hmm. movement is a sequential steps in this process that causes people to move. Here's what's so important to greater areas of commitment. Mm -hmm. So if someone just comes into your church, they've committed to something. They've committed to come into your worship experience. What we then do, I think sometimes, unfortunately, is we want them to move from the commitment of attending your church to jumping into falling in love and just being with Jesus, like right away. So we'll make an appeal and hope that they'll make in that moment a decision to get baptized. Mm -hmm. But we find that there's different levels of commitment. If you look at the walk of Jesus, where he was with the disciples, the first commitment they made was follow me. Then as they kept walking with him, he was taking them to greater levels of commitment. We need that to be clear at our church. So we designed a simple process that moves people and we want to relieve congestion. So here are the patterns of movement we have. We place the different programs we have, Love, Grow, Serve, along a strategic process. And each of our ministries under Love, Grow, and Serve move people from one level of commitment to the next. Um, so when we look at movement in Mount Rubido, movement answers the question, how do we move people from one level of commitment uh, to the next? So if you see the screen here, um, we promote movement by placing weekly programs at key points along our strategic process. So here's what we do. We ask people to be a part of a worship service. Then the next level of commitment we want you to make is be a part of a group. Then the next level of commitment we want you to make is would you reach uh, other people with us by volunteering or serving? Or if you've been a part of our church because maybe you came to serve with us, what's the next level of commitment we want you to make? 
be a part of a group, be a part of a worship experience. So it doesn't have to be in order, love, grow, serve, but it's very clear. If you're growing, you also need to love, come to worship. If you're only in a group, that's not cool. You need to be a part of worship and you need to start volunteering as well. So we say, we ask you to do three things per week. Love, attend a worship experience, grow, be a part of some group experience, and then also serve, volunteer, or be a part of a serve experience. Mm -hmm. And what our responsibility is, is to create, as we said, how will we succeed? Environments and experiences in each of those areas. So pretty much what a member has is a menu of how they can be poured into and then pour into the week. So they'll look at the menu, they'll look at our announcements, and we're so intentional, actually, said that our announcements are broken down into love, grow, mm -hmm. and serve. So now when people hear it, they say, okay, this is a sermon series that's being preached. These are the different opportunities for me to be a part of a worship experience. Mm -hmm. Here are the three different kinds of groups I can be a part of. I can be part of an open group. I can be a part of a closed group. I can be a part of a social group. And here are the different ways I can volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so we want people to know, don't just come to church. Don't just be a part of a group, but do those, those three things. Because mm -hmm. um, again, a disciple is someone who moves from being recipient of the church's mission to responsible for the church's mission. Mm -hmm. Um, let me zip through these so I can get through, get, of course, get through the questions. Um, alignment. This is the arrangement of all ministries and staff around this process. Mm -hmm. It's simple. We want our members to love, grow, serve. So if you have a ministry that doesn't fit into any of that, you can't do it in Mount Rubio. Mm -hmm. Um, do it on your own. That's great, but you can't do it here because our goal is to create disciples. We believe disciples love, grow, serve, and everything that we do needs to contribute to them being able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I think focus, in order for our discipleship process to be effective, we've got to be extremely focused. So we live by the concept, less is more. We don't try to have 50 things under grow, um, you know, 20 things under serve. We keep it as simple as possible. So we don't look at ourselves like Fridays. If you go to Fridays, they got Tex-Mex, they've got all different kinds of burgers, they've got Italian, they got everything. We're like, no, we have a very simple menu. When you go to a gourmet restaurant, you don't have a menu that's this thick. It's usually like one, maybe two pages. You can just flip it over. And that's what it is because we want it to be simple. We don't want people uh, to feel uh, overwhelmed. Um, so to help us gain clarity on that, we have what is called a horizon template. And I'm going to actually completely not give you all this because I think we've got some questions. What the template does with all the information that we've answered is we now ask the question, where are we going to be 20 years from now, three years from now, a year from now, and then 90 days from now to accomplish that. So how it works is what we do for the next 90 days helps us accomplish what happens in the next year. Mm -hmm. What we do in the next year helps us accomplish what happens in the next three years. What we're accomplishing over the next three years helps us accomplish what takes place in the next five to 20 years. And when you write that out and make that very clear, after I've accomplished year one, I jump up into year three pull what I wrote down there, put it into year one, and then my next 90 days does that. Mm -hmm. Again, what does that do? It keeps us focused. People mm -hmm. know where we're going. It's clear. And there's a healthy culture because people are like, this is where we're going the next five to 20. Here's where we're going the next three. Here's where we're going the next one. Here's where we're going the next 90. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to stop there, Seth. I know, you know for some people that might be like drinking water out of a fire hose. Um, and I'm going to pull off the screen for, 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 for a moment. Um, pause to share. Um, but that's really kind of where we've gone through at Mount Rubido to get where we are. And that's where we've been able to create this culture, um, we believe, of, of growth. And we need to do better. And uh, we will. But I want to open it up to, um, you know, the questions you might have for what we just went through. Yeah, this is great. Um, for those who are asking questions about the recording, this is being recorded. And uh, we will send an email. I will send an email out where you can view the archive. You can share it with your team. Um, so definitely we will be doing that, um, as is the last, um, last week, last month's, uh, webinar was also recorded and shared. We're also going to store them on our website, um, visionclarity360.com under webinars. I'm still building out the archive page, but it should be done in a couple of weeks where you can also access them there. If you don't, for some reason, get the email. Pastor, thank you so much, Mike. Thanks so much for just sharing. Um, I know we've had a few questions that have come in and that we've tried to, that I've kind of answered on my own. Uh, I guess my one question for you is, I mean, this sounds like pie in the sky. I mean, come on now. Like, I mean, you got a staff, you know, you got this clarity, you got this alignment. I feel like the reality is 
is especially within our faith tradition, and, and I'm sure other other denominations are, are not, not not different, is that when you inherit a church, like it's one thing if you plan a church and you start from scratch and you can really form the DNA, but you inherited a church. I mean, Rubido was 30, 40, 50 years old when you inherited it, right? So you inherited this church. Um, how were you able to move this church that has its own traditions, its own programs, its own ways of doing things, its own culture, how were you able to move them into this love, grow, serve? Did, did people get mad? Did people leave the church? Did people say, well, if I can't do my ministry, then, you know, I'm, I'm not returning tithe. Like, how were you able to move your congregation through that process? Yeah, so I, I think the first question that I had to ask is, you need to determine, does your church have a very clear vision and direction of where it's going? So I followed uh, Pastor Plucky Fordham before I came to Rubio at Allen Chapel. I go to Allen Chapel and something became very abundantly clear to me. Plucky had taken them through a very similar process. And so what ends up happening is they were very clear on why they existed, what they were doing, all those different kinds of things. So I didn't need to come in and really change that. And it was actually, it was really good. And that's why immediately when I was able to get there, there was no period of me having to grow into stuff. We started to see growth immediately because I just picked up right where Pucky left off. I didn't try and hit the reset button. Something that was a little different at Rubido because they had just moved into this building, they were trying to figure out their new identity. So what I did is I found out that your identity is only right now the identity of the franchise, which isn't an identity on its own. And so the way I found that out is I started asking the leaders different questions and I found that I was getting so many different answers. And so because of that, I said, guys, it's not clear why we're here. So if it's not clear why we're here, we need to establish that together. Let's do this process. And so we went through that process to do it. Now you asked a couple of questions like, was it hard? Was it difficult? Did people leave? The answer is yes, they absolutely left mm -hmm. because they wanted their own traditions. And guess what? My attendance, I have no problem saying, Rubido at one time was like 1,400 in attendance, not on the books. It was like that. And I'll tell you when we started to lose people. It wasn't when I started to preach differently or do weird sermon series. It was when people started to see clarity. And when they started to see that, man, this church is not okay with me just sitting in the pew. I've literally had people say, Pastor, I need to go to a different church. I said, why? They said, because we just want a church where we can enjoy good music and good preaching. And you don't want that. So you've got to be comfortable knowing you're going to lose people when you become clear about where you're going. Because not everyone wants to go where you're going. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, because that's not why we exist. Mm -hmm. If we existed to make people comfortable, it'd be different. But we existed to reach people far from God. And I've recognized not everyone wants to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's good. And I, I really want our, our, our um, attendees to really catch this. Is that anytime you cast... Okay, so number one casting a compelling vision like Pastor Kelly has done, like, like we try to do at Vision Clarity when working with churches, it takes time. Let me just say that on the front side. It takes time. And as you can see from what Pastor Kelly has laid out, it takes a level of intentionality. You're not just going to stumble into it. It's not just going to be something that you're going to pull, you know, um, from, from a book that you've read somewhere. No, it takes building a team, meeting with those people. He said it took him 18 months. He's been in his church 10 years. Um, I was there four of those years and there were ups and downs as it pertains to trying to move the church forward. So again, Rome wasn't built in a day, but if you're consistent, if you're deliberate, if you're intentional, Rome will be built. And I think that goes for your church. So what I'm hearing is number one, it takes time. Um, the second, the second thing is that a vision does is a vision clarity. Like you have, it draws a line in the sand and it says, yeah. Hey guys, this is who we are. This is where we're going. You can get on board or you can get off board. Any bit. I think in an ideal world, people think that a vision should unify everyone. Visions don't unify everyone. Even think about our country, America. Our current president has a vision for this country that is not unifying. The former president, President Obama, had a vision for the country that wasn't unifying. Some people were for it. Some people were against it. When Christ was here, Christ had a vision for the kingdom and it wasn't unifying. Some people were for it. Some people were against it. And so to think that you can come into your church and that you can cast a compelling vision that will unify everyone. Pastor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I just haven't seen it. I just don't know if that type of thing exists. Right now, ideally, you would hope that the majority of people would come on board. Right. You don't want to lose people, obviously. 
but you just have to understand that anytime you, you, you state with clarity, this is where we're going, there will be people who choose not to be long and, be a, and go for that ride. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why what is so important that I'll say, speaking, in, speaking specifically individually to the leader, one of the reasons it took us a long time and Seth, you remember us even being a part of, part of this process, is we wanted to be clear that this was what God told us. Because when that becomes clear, and not one of those weird things like, well, you know, where it's like, God told me this makes zero sense. So, um, but God told us, you know, no, like it made sense. It was a biblically sound vision and direction. And because of that, we were comfortable with people making a decision that they didn't want to be a part of it. Because it was one thing to be a part of something that wasn't of God. And the reason that people didn't want to be a part of it is it wasn't what they were used to from the institution. Because I'm just going to be very honest, the institution doesn't teach you to vision cast for your individual church. No, it, it teaches you to accept the worldwide vision, which doesn't always match where your local neighborhood church is. It doesn't match those issues. So we had to figure out, okay, what is that? Why do we exist? Mount Rubido, we're our own entity in a different location. And when we got that from the Lord and we moved forward, it didn't always line up with what our institution said. And that made some people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It didn't break principle. It just didn't line up with people, how they were used to church being structured. Mm -hmm. And no matter what institution you're in, Catholic, whether it's Methodist, the institution has a job, sustain itself. Mm -hmm. The church has a vision and a mission, reach people. Mm -hmm. And those two things will hit because in order to reach people, you might have to do things that seem unsustaining to an, an, an institution. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that tension's always going to be. Not just an Adventist tension, it's a tension anytime you're part of an institution. Yeah. And so what we were just thankfully able to do is because of the time, we were able to show people that this vision this organization, the way that we're structured, doesn't line up with institutional structure, but it does keep with biblical principles. Mm -hmm. And that is what, you know, you have to take time to work people through because that was the biggest difficulty for us is there's a mindset that people have, which is no different than Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got completely flip over, not just structure, but theology. Right. Um, Matthew 5 and 6 is all about him undoing theology to get the mindset and remember their theology unfortunately did influence their structure so that's what we had to do as well uh well, and so go ahead no no please go ahead so just a few questions i want to run through in, in the eight minutes we have left one person asked a question give me just a short 30 second answer um can you flush out the idea of the menu you have like a a, a ministry program menu um what are some of the things that are considered when you're doing that menu type of thing like can you flush that out a little bit yeah, so, so the menu literally is what are the different opportunities we're offering our people to love, grow, and serve? Mm -hmm. So our goal is, remember we said, a disciple is someone who loves, worship, grows, group, and serves, volunteer, or is a part of it. So what we don't want to say is the only group you can be a part of is Sabbath school. So we're open to say that, look, if your schedule doesn't allow you to come to Sabbath school, we're going to let you know there's small groups you can be a part of during the week. If you can't be a part of a small group or you can't be a part of a Sabbath school, there are social groups that you can be a part of. Mm -hmm. So our thing is, we don't want to just give you one opportunity. We want to give you several things you can choose from so that you can be a part of our groups. So, so, um, so, so look at it like, so almost look at it like this. Um, you go to a restaurant and you know the restaurant owner says in their mind, in order for a customer to leave satisfied, we need to provide a beverage, an appetizer, a meal, and a dessert. Those are the four things we need to provide, beverage, appetizer, meal, dessert. And so then you say, okay, what are all of our options for beverages? Coke, Sprite, Pepsi, Diet Coke, water, juice. And so you list all of your beverage options under your beverages. What are our options for appetizers? You know, um, some type of queso dip, some type of uh, spinach dip, some type of, here are appetizers. What are all our options for? Our main course, what are all our options for dessert? And so with the church, I think what you've done is you say, okay, hey, what are our worship options, right? In order for you to grow spiritually, to become a disciple, you need to love, grow, and serve. So what are our worship options? What are our uh, grow options? What are our serve options? The challenge, though, that I want to just ask is, what do you do when there's a ministry that tries to do all three of those things or is not doing any of those things? Um. 
they don't exist. I mean, you, I mean, you, you, you it, it's a tough call, but that's why you get by. It's like, well, this is what you're going to do. So actually, we cut so many ministries. I know, remember when we were there, man, and we were trying to, but we actually got to the point where we were able to do it. So we cut it. And I think your, your restaurant example is great. I want to add something to it, though. Beverage, appetizer, you know, meal, dessert. Here's the difference. Under um, appetizer, meal, dessert, for example, we don't have Italian, Chinese, mm. um, Mexican. And those, those are technically meals, but they're right. all from different things. We have recognized this is the kind of restaurant we are. We're mm -hmm. a Japanese restaurant. So yeah, we're gonna have ramen, sushi, and you know, you know soup, but it's all mm -hmm. Japanese. So right. all of those things we're gonna do because of why we exist have to fit yeah. why we exist. It can't just be a good menu of, yeah. of so. so someone else asked a question. Um, uh, Jason asked a question, how did the institution respond to the transitions? Are they supportive? And I think he may be talking about uh, um, almost like the conference institution, I would just take a yeah. step further and say not just the conference, but the members who are, you know, kind of married to the institution. As you're making this transition, did you find support from, you know, the conference, from your members? You know, how, how did that, how did that look? Yeah. So let me tell you why everything I went through this process and all of this document was so big, even though I do have a more open conference, which is one of the reasons I'm, I'm here and I love it so much. Um, I brought them along in, along the way. So I'm turning into them my horizon storyline. I'm letting them see mm -hmm. my discipleship process. I let them see my strategic plan every single year. And obviously it's been voted in somebody's church. So they're like, okay, bet. Like, this is where you're going. We're going to completely support that. Um, and I think if you don't have a conference that's innovative, one of the things you can do to help them, or if you're struggling with your, let's say your conference is supported, but your church isn't, um, bring it to your conference official or leader or whatever your institution is, share with them what you're doing, bring them along the process. So now your members see, oh, this isn't a rogue pastor. This is our administration that also sees that it's okay. Mm -hmm. And if they think it's okay, then maybe we can buy into it. Too. Yeah. Yeah. These are great questions. Um, you know, some others have come in through email. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. I think, man, one of my, I guess one of my main takeaways from everything you're saying is that in order to lead a church or organization forward, it takes intentional, create courageous leadership, right? I know a lot of pastors, we, we try to keep everyone happy and, and try to um, um, meet all of the various stakeholders' needs and don't want to ruffle the, you know, rustle the boat. We want to keep the tithe payers happy. We want to keep the young people happy. And at the end of the day, I think in order to really follow God courageously, you have to realize that some people aren't just going to, they're not going to be happy right? It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and you may lose some people, but I promise you for the people that you lose, you will gain more people. In fact, I would pray that prayer like God for every one person I le we leave who we lose because of this direction. Man, man, may, may, you, may you send two to replace them. May you send three to replace them. If you really feel called and convicted that direction that you're leading the church is of the Lord, then you just have to, lead, you have to go forward courageously. Now, I will say this is that and, and Pastor Kelly, you did this in your process, that you didn't follow what I think a lot of pastors do is that Moses model, where the pastor goes to the mountain by themselves, they hear from God by themselves, and they come down and say, okay, church, this is what we're going to do. I think what you were able to do is obviously you heard from God on your own, but you, you brought your team along, right? And so it wasn't like a direct edict from the Lord on high hey, we're doing Love, Grow, Serve. But it was like you, and I was there, you kind of brought your team along, you brought the elders along. It was a series of conversations. People were involved. People had a chance to weigh in and buy in and give their feedback and make tweaks and make adjustments. And I just want to encourage pastors and leaders to do that, to make sure that along the way that you, that you don't do this thing on your own. There's a saying that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And if you want your church to go far, you have to bring your core leadership team. You're not going to bring you're not going to be able to get everyone on board. Right. So I just want to be clear. It doesn't mean that, well, we got one sister who's holding out. So we're not going to move forward until that one sister gets on board. Like, no, we're going to move forward. If I got 60, 70, 80 percent of my people on board, we're going. 
right? We're going. So, um, Pastor, thank you. As we wrap up, just any last closing words for your pe for the people um, that you just want to share? No, no, yeah, I think you said you know the best, Seth, and I, I'll just echo it again. Uh, you got to be courageous in your leadership. If you're afraid to lose your job, you'll 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 always play it safe. And nobody ever made a difference in the world by playing it safe. Um, now, safe doesn't mm -hmm. mean not smart, but it means you got to be willing to take risks, and you've got to trust that where you're going is where God has called you to. And if He's called you there, there's no place He's going to take you where His grace is not going to keep you. Amen. Listen, thank you guys so much. I just want to share with you real quick. If you haven't seen it already, you can go to visionclarity360.com on this site. Um, I would love to have a, uh, a, a free consultation call with you. If you have some more questions, you're trying to figure out how to move your church forward, how to create a shared vision. Pastor Kelly, you showed it really briefly at the end, this thing called the Horizon Storyline. I really specialize in helping churches build out that Horizon Storyline. And so if you want to say, you know what, man, I need some help. How do we clarify our five-year? How do we clarify our three-year objectives? How do we clarify our one-year? I would love to come alongside of you all. You can visit Vision Clarity 360. Just click the Register Now button, um, and you will be able to, um, you'll be able to you know, put your information in there, I'll jump on the phone with you. I can hear what your issues are, your challenges. And uh, would love to come and partner with you uh, and with your church as you all are trying to move forward. Uh, and Seth, if I could just um, yes, Ben, just say one more thing, guys. Seriously, a lot of the different things that you guys saw on the presentation today was because we brought uh, Pastor Lorda in to take us through that, and so it added even more clarity. I cannot suggest enough. If it's a free thirty-minute vision clarity consultation, you have nothing to lose by sitting there and doing that it will change the game for your mm -hmm. ministry. I'm not just saying that. Our, our church in the last two years has just gone so much further because of what he's been able to do. So it's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's been an honor to work with you guys. And uh, I would be honored to, to work with any of you all who are online just the same. I feel, I feel it's truly a pleasure and, it's, and uh, it's truly a blessing to be able to do that. I know we got some other questions coming in. Um, I wanna respect our time. I will try to follow up the email um, with, those, with those additional questions and, um, and we'll go from there. So Pastor, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, to those who are with us, again, I'll be sending out the link. If you missed it, you can share it with your team and obviously you can jump over to the website and you can follow up with me on a vision clarity. Also, too, if, if some people want to continue on the conversation outside the email, they want to hit me up on Instagram or something like that, more than happy to, uh, to connect that way as well. So. Definitely. Wonderful. All right. Thanks so much. You all have a wonderful, blessed day. All right.